It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our last section of the day. Um, and it should be a, a really excellent one based on past years. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ramesh Sicarius, the President and CEO and Medical Director of the Chronic Pain Center of Excellence for Canadian Veterans, the CPCOE. Uh, Dr. Zacharias has been in this role since 2020 uh, and uh, is at the helm of a multi-pronged organization that is promoting uh, best available evidence for uh, treating chronic pain in veterans. Uh, before that, he was the medical director of the Michael G. DeGroote Pain Clinic at McMaster University Medical Center. And from 2017 to 2019, he was the co-chair of the Adult Chronic Pain Network for the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. He's truly a, an expert on the treatment of chronic pain. Dr. Mahmoud Sayam is uh, also joining the presentation. Dr. Sayam obtained his Doctor of Pharmacy degree from the University of Waterloo in 2021. He is an active clinical pharmacist at Hamilton Health Sciences in the DeGroote Outpatient Pain Clinic. And I appreciate both of you participating today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, James, and thank you, Alan, for inviting us to speak here today. Um, just so you're aware, my uh, I have a focused pain practice in pain uh, at Hamilton Health Sciences, and I've been prescribing cannabis now since 2008. So I'm uh, thrilled to be here today with my colleague uh, Mahmoud, and we uh, we treat our patients together at the pain clinic. We're gonna talk uh, about these six areas. I'm gonna describe a little bit about the difference between acute and chronic pain. Uh, James, you did an outstanding talk on understanding the endocannabinoid system and describe major cannabinoids. We'll briefly touch on it for those who were not here this morning. And uh, Jason, you provided outstanding evidence for medical cannabis and chronic pain, and we're just gonna summarize it. And then we will go over the various optimizing routes of an administration. And then we'll share with you three patients that Mahmoud and I have treated recently. So when you look at chronic pain versus acute pain, chronic pain has been defined by two variables, pain that has persisted for more than three months. But more importantly, the thing that's forgotten is pain that's out of the ordinary. I've treated patients who have fractured ankles, and in, within six to eight weeks, they have noticed a significant difference within that ankle where it's much more swollen, red, hot, and is starting to show signs. And they're on a trajectory to chronic pain. So while you do need 90 days to be able to define it, you will have a good idea when some injury occurs, whether it's surgery, a fracture, or soft tissue injury, when there's bone and tissue that's damaged, your body releases pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, interleukin-1, interleukin-2, 6, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. However, when you damage the nerve and it creates dysfunction, you have increased activity of primary nociceptor neurons. The combination of both can result in central sensitization and you get cortical reorganizations in the region of the brain and glia activation. A big shout out to two Canadians who have played a significant role in identifying the changes in the glia. That's Jeff Mogul at McGill and Mike Salter at SickKids. They've done a lot of work over the last 20 years in identifying the changes that occur in the glia. When pain persists, it releases certain neuropeptides, substance P, neuropeptide Y, CGRP, and all of these are used to treat them. When you get persistent pain, it not only results in central sensitization, but you also get peripheral sensitization. And there is a very small sub subset of patients um, that I have treated over the years, which develop neurogenic inflammation where you see tissue swelling, edema, extravasation, vasomotor changes, allodynia, and hyperalgesia. When you combine all those features, they're often referred to as chronic regional pain syndrome. And those are probably the most difficult 
pain patients to treat. Okay, so how does this tie into medical cannabis and the um, and the endocannabinoid system? So, in order to answer this question, we need to sort of uh, talk about the endocannabinoid system a little bit, um, which involves um, lipid neurotransmitters as well as the respective receptors such as CB1 and CB2 over here. When these neurotransmitters are released, they bind to their respective receptors, of course, and they exert a multitude of effects, including modulating pain, um, stress, sleep, and a, a host of cognitive functioning as well. So uh, the endocannabinoid uh, neurotransmitters here are 2-AG and anandamide. Uh, when they bind to CB1, which is mainly found in the uh, central nervous system, but can also be found in the peripheral ner nervous system as well. They can negatively regulate neurotransmission throughout the nervous system, and this also includes pain signals as well. On the other hand, when we look at CB2 receptors that are found mainly in immune cells, um, this one binds specifically to 2-AG. Uh, they can regulate activity of central nervous system immune cells also. So if we zoom in into the synapse, um, if there are no cannabinoids, what we see is this overinflux of excitatory signals associated with pain, with mood, hunger, and sleep. And these signals, of course, can be acetylcholinergic, they can be dopaminergic, glutaminergic, or norgenergic as well. Uh, but of course, they're not limited to these um, neurotransmitters. When we add cannabinoids or in the presence of cannabinoids, when they bind to the respective receptors, we see a dampening down or we see uh, a lot less uh, neurotransmission. So when cannabinoids bind to CB1 um, in the central nervous system, they downregulate neurotransmission of pain signals. Uh, cannabinoids or those that bind to CB2 in immune cells, they reduce the release of cytokines or chemokines and that ties in um, to having an anti-inflammatory process. So where does medical cannabis fit in? We've talked about um, endocannabinoids and the role in managing acute pain. Um, however, when, it, when we talk about chronic pain, we see that the endocannabinoid uh, system becomes um, a lot less or it functions a lot less. Um, so if we are able to sort of supplement with exogenous cannabinoids, either in the form of synthetic cannabinoids like nabilone or phytocannabinoids in the form of medical marijuana, we can sort of reestablish that balance um, and we can supposedly treat chronic pain that way as well. So let's talk a little bit about the major cannabinoids that we're going to be talking about uh, throughout this presentation, of course. Medical cannabis comes in different forms. We have phytocannabinoids over here, and we also have synthetic cannabinoids. So phytocannabinoids, as we all know, plant-based cannabinoids extracted from the cannabis plant. The ones that are moderately to well-studied, of course, we have THC and we have CBD. Those that are a lot less studied are CBN, CBG, CBC as well. Uh, they come in a a wide variety of different dosage forms, so oils, capsules, dried extracts, edibles, things of that sort. And when it comes to synthetic cannabinoids, what they are, they're of course pharmaceutical grade cannabis. They're synthesized in labs by pharmaceutical companies. Some of them are THC mimetics like nabilone. And the, the, the benefit of synthetic cannabinoids is that of course, because they're pharmaceutical grade, you get this quality control process. So you know exactly the product that you're getting would be an abalone at exactly a dose of either 0.5 or 1 milligram. However, what makes medical marijuana a little bit more complex is that the same thing cannot be said when it comes to phytocannabinoids or um, medical marijuana, but we'll talk about that later on in the presentation. So tetrahydrocannabinol or THC comes actually in two different forms. So the one that is mainly known is Till delta 9 THC. So this one is the psychoactive um, cannabinoid. They bind to mainly the CB1 receptor in the central nervous system and they exert this psychoactive effect um, in alteration of mood, balance, senses, or behavior. And we see delta 9 THC is this carboxylated form over here. Uh, they can be dopaminergic, so they can increase dopamine. And this has or ties into the reinforcing property 
as well as the euphoric effects that um, can result from the overconsumption of THC at high doses for an extended amount of time. But clinically speaking, they can also modulate pain signals, increase somnolence, and reduce anxiety. Delta-8 THC is a lot less elucidated, but it's a decarboxylated form of uh, THC. It is um, less psychoactive. It does also bind to CB1 receptors and supposedly has antiemetic properties, and it increases appetite. This one, of course, has gained a lot of attention in the past years. Um, CBD or cannabidiol, as well as cannabinol, CBN. So CBD is dubbed the non-psychoactive or medicinal cannabinoid. Uh, we normally don't like to use this definition just because we, we've seen that THC also does have medicinal effects as well, but that's how um, it's commonly known. It also acts on the brain to modulate the psychoactive effects of THC um, in that it is a negative allosteric modulator. It can bind to a whole range of receptors and also has a role in modulating pain signals as well as reducing inflammation. CBN, on the other hand, it's a metabolite of delta-9 THC, a lot less potent, um, and it's not well studied, but may possess immunosuppressive uh, properties. This diagram over here illustrates what we mean by negative allosteric modulation and why it's always important to add in a little bit of CBD, especially in patients who are going to be using products that contain THC, and that CBD can actually bind to a different site, not the active site, but a different site in the CB1 receptor that does not or prevents the efficient binding of THC to uh, CB1. And what that means is that it either results in a decrease effects and subsequently a decrease in the side effects that can stem from THC. Contrary, we also have positive allosteric modulators, which are compounds that can actually do the opposite and uh, make the binding between THC and CB1 much more efficient. And that, of course, uh, increases the effects of THC. And that means also um, a higher risk of side effects as well. So what about other cannabinoids? We've mainly talked about two or three cannabinoids. But just to appreciate this, there are about 100 active metabolites that we still don't know much about um, that are still not elucidated very well. The two that are mainly studied are THC and CBD. So how does this tie in clinically or therapeutically? Well, medical cannabis or medical marijuana, as I've indicated before, doesn't have appropriate quality control. So one product that may be a 1 in 20 ratio between THC and CBD, right, can also have other active metabolites that are not accounted for. So this is what creates this intravariance or intravariance between products. And that's why finding an appropriate cannabis regimen can actually be time consuming. Um, and it may take some time as well. But this is just something to, to appreciate over here. So um, Jason talked a little bit uh, earlier today about um, the evidence for uh, medical cannabis. This moderate clinical evidence in four areas, um, multiple sclerosis and spasticity, it's felt that it may help to reduce refractory MS-associated spasticity, as well as pain. Most of the studies have used oral cannabis. For neuropathic pain, it's important to realize that cannabis may reduce the symptoms of refractory neuropathic pain secondary to HIV or spinal cord injuries. But this should not be a first line for people with chronic pain. You can use it in individuals who have failed multiple first line treatments and synthetic cannabinoids. Where there's better evidence is in pediatric seizure disorders. It's to be used in exceptional circumstances, such as those with drug resistant seizures, such as Dravet syndrome and lennox gastrol syndrome. And finally, there's moderate clinical evidence in chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. Again, it should be used in patients who are refractory to the standard therapies, such as nabilone. And there was a control, placebo-controlled trial of 81 that showed significant reduction in symptoms of patients with the refractory chronic-induced uh, nausea and vomiting with a combination of THC and CBD. What kind of pain could cannabis treat? Again, there's some evidence, but 
it should not be considered the first line of treatment. There's small trials that shown cannabis to be beneficial for fibromyalgia-related pain, but there's much better evidence for other treatments of fibromyalgia. Once again, in all of these, the evidence is insufficient to recommend routine use. Cancer-related pain, once again, it's the small trials, but insufficient to recommend routine use. Crohn's disease is interesting. Theoretically, CBD binding to CB2 receptors may help regulate the release of inflammatory cytokines. But once again, there are small trials showing conflicting evidence for the use of cannabis. And in chronic pain, data suggests that cannabis might reduce some forms of chronic pain. The evidence is insufficient, but even in chronic pain, it's not the first line treatment. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about optimizing routes of administration. So we know, or we get this question asked a lot, what is the best route um, to take? And, and I believe this question was also asked uh, during one of the uh, one of the presentations. So of course, the three main types or routes of administration of cannabis, we have inhalation routes, either through smoking or vaporizing. We have ingestions um, in the form of oils, capsules, or edibles. And we'll also have topical routes. Each one of them have completely different pharmacokinetic profile, and that can tie in as to exactly um, you know, whether it's going to be beneficial specifically for the use of chronic pain or not. So for instance, when we look at inhalation, it has a bioavailability um, of about 50%. So about 50% of the cannabinoid content reaches the bloodstream. Uh, of course, it starts working within minutes, so within 10 minutes or so. So it has a very fast onset of action. It peaks in about 20 minutes and lasts for up to four hours. And this is, we generally find um, chronic pain patients who have sleeping difficulties, and of course, that's a high percentage of them. They generally like to inhale their cannabis right before their sleep, uh, just because, because of that very fast onset of, fact, of action and also that peak effect, a very high peak effect. They're able to um, reduce their sleep onset and they're able to go to sleep a lot, a lot quicker. When it comes to ingestion, we see uh, the bioavailability is reduced up to 20%, and that's because it has to go through first pass metabolism. It starts working in about an hour. It peaks in about four hours and lasts up to six hours. When we look at topical routes, it rarely enters, enters the bloodstream, and that can be beneficial um, if we're worried about you know, patients who have polypharmacy or they're taking a whole bunch of medications and we're worried about drug interactions and there are drug interactions between cannabis and other uh, medications. Um, a, they can act on CB2 receptors that are found on the skin and tissues beneath. So for peripheral sensitization, where the pain is superficial, they can be or they may be beneficial. But when pain is deep enough and when pain is widespread, it actually becomes impractical to use something like a topical route in this case. This figure over here illustrates the difference, again, between inhalation and ingestion and why uh, ingestion routes may be more preferable um, in the treatment of chronic pain. Because when we look at inhalation, yes, it does have a very fast onset of action, but you get this very um, high peak, um, a high concentration of cannabinoids that are entering the bloodstream. So in products that have a very high concentration of THC, uh, what we can find is that you're more likely or the patient's more likely to experience side effects using inhalation routes. Whereas if we consume cannabis orally in the context of chronic pain, theoretically, that may be better because you have this um, sustained duration um, of effect. Uh, so it's it'll be able to manage or target chronic pain uh, a lot more efficiently, and you're not going to experience these sudden peaks. Therefore, you're a lot less, uh, the patient has a, a, a lot less risk of experiencing side effects. And of course, this also reduces or decreases the burden of administration. So looking, closely at inhalation routes, smoking and vaporizing, because there's definitely going to be patients who will still continue um, inhalation routes. So when we look at smoking, it could involve joints, bongs, or pipes, and it exposes the user to a very significant amount of toxic compounds because it's usually combusted or is heated at a temperature of 230 degrees or more. 
there is this common notion that um, we, we normally, you know, patients do ask us about the use of bongs and how it can actually be uh, or provide a cleaner smoke. However, when we find that the cannabinoid to tar ratio is actually, it remains the same between smoking cannabis and also uh, the use of bongs. So that notion is, is not entirely true. The difference between smoking and vaporizing is that with vaporizing, you're using a vaporizer that is able to regulate the temperature that the uh, dried flower or the liquid concentrate is being um, heated at, usually to anything less than 230 degrees. And they find that when that happens, you're it results in less formation of toxic compounds. It is important to note, though, that with vaporizing concentrated liquids, you may be it may be um, worse for lung health than vaporizing dried cannabis, and we'll we'll talk about why. This table just summarizes the difference between can cannabis smoke and tobacco smoke. We know how tobacco smoke and how detrimental it is, uh, but if you compare it to can cannabis smoke, it actually has five times more carbon monoxide three times more level of tar, 20 times more ammonia. So definitely not um, not safe, as we've also um, heard in other presentations as well. And of course, uh, we know the risks of uh, smoking and how they can um, impact um, lung health. So the final verdict in patients who continue or insist in using inhalation routes, of course, this is um, not a surprise to, to any of us, but vaping cannabis is a safer alternative to smoking. However, it does not come without its risks. Of course, we know that uh, there's this condition, E-Valley, e, e or vaping product use associated with lung injury, where, um, and that is of course more common in patients who vaporize using liquid concentrates because some of these liquid concentrates can contain filler or cutting agents um, that can actually adhere to the lungs and it can actually lead to, to lung injury. Of course, risk is greatest at high use of THC uh, containing vapes if they are frequent users, so five times or more a day, and they acquire products that have, um, you know, from unregulated suppliers or uh, sources. When we talk about um, ingestions or when we look at ingestion routes, it usually comes in the form of capsules like soft gels or oils or edibles. So the oils or the soft gels, they come in a wide variety of different ratios, mainly it's written as CBD to THC. Using a CBD oil or using um, liquid formulations is actually preferred. Why? Because you're more likely, the patient is more likely to sort of move up or titrate the dose using whatever increments they want. So they can use as increments as low as 0.1 milliliter, and they're more likely to find the optimal dose that way compared to using, let's say, a CBD capsule that, you know, only comes in concentrations as low as 2.5 milligrams, then they can only move up uh, by that amount. Edible products are also not a preferred. Why? Because sometimes um, the, the patients are at greater risk of consuming high amounts. So in, in products that have very high amount uh, of THC, what they can do, especially in products that are also palatable, uh, the patient can cons continue or keep on consuming that, that edible, but sometimes as we know, with ingestion routes, it has a delayed onset. Um, so that could lead to a, you know, if the patient does not manage or does not wait for, for, for the medication to sort of um, kick in, it can lead to a super therapeutic um, outcome or um, high risk of adverse effects, especially in products that has a high amount of THC. So to summarize, of course, we would prefer um, or we recommend patients to choose cannabis oils, generally speaking, why? Because they are much easier to dose, fine adjustment of dosing, of course. They can calculate the exact milligrams um, that are required. We ask them to choose products that are CBD dominant. We advise them to you even use a smaller amount than what the label recommends, so 0.1 or 0.2 at bedtime. And then we also advise them to wait a couple of days or so before titrating the dose. So again, this is a nice infographic that you would provide to patients. So starting at a very low dose as 0.1 and moving up by another 0.1. And you keep on doing that every three to five days until you find a dose that is providing benefit. Of course, you ask them to stop if they are getting good relief. Um, and also if they're experiencing side effects, they would also stop and lower the dose. And if you find that, or if the patient finds that they're using up to two milliliters of the product without any benefit at all, and with 
even without even marginal benefits, then it would be worthwhile to sort of um, try a different product in that case. So routes of administration in a nutshell, we suggest to use cannabis orally as opposed to inhalation. Why? Because it eliminate, eliminates respiratory side effects. And of course, with ingesting cannabis, it's able to last longer and that may be better option for chronic pain. The preferred method of ingesting cannabis is through the use of cannabis oils or soft gels as opposed to edibles, because as we've indicated, it's easier to measure and find the right dose using liquids. Um, and it minimizes the risk of overconsumption and potential adverse effects from THC uh, for those who, you know, um, use edible products. So let's discuss a little bit of practical applications now. So when we select the most appropriate product, we focus on three main things. The first thing, of course, is the dose, which is the concentration of CBD to THC. For cannabis na naive patients, of course, we would start at CBD dominant products. Usually it's a one in 20 ratio of uh, THC to CBD. For those who are a little bit experienced with cannabis, they've tried multiple CBD products um, to no avail, uh, then this would probably be uh, a good time for them to use a product that has a little extra THC to see if they're able to, if it's able to, if they're able to attain any benefit from the use of THC. We of course prescribe products that can be easily dosed as we've indicated, or as we've mentioned, um, in this case, cannabis oils due to their, um, their ease of measuring. Um, and then of course, cannabis oils, uh, it has the added benefit of being able to adjust the dose and moving up um, using whatever increments uh, the patient wants. We also recommend choosing suppliers that are reliable and have a consistent supply. So some companies do not stock products adequately. adequately. Um, some products, they always substitute uh, products. And again, this ties into that idea or that notion we discussed earlier on with poor quality control when it comes to medical marijuana. So it is very important to choose a supplier that is a lot more um, reliable in this case. So this is an example that you would see. You would see products that are um, CBD dominant, in this case, a 20 to 1 ratio. So of course, for cannabis naive patients, we would start over here, and then we can move up uh, the ladder slowly if they're not attaining benefit from products that are CBD dominant. So there are also products that come in one to one ratio of THC to CBD. And of course, there's products that are THC dominant that have a higher concentration of THC uh, compared to CBD at, um, at a certain dose. And of course, there are products that fall in between these, um, the, the major doses. So what concentration of CBD to THC to choose now? Again, there's not a lot of data as to exactly what initial dose to start with. Uh, generally speaking, um, a good dose to start in terms of CBD would be anywhere between 1 to 2.5 milligrams of CBD. So this CBD dominant product, it has less than 1 milligram per mil of THC and 20 milligrams per mil of CBD. So if they were to incorporate that start low and move up slow method, if they start at 0.1 milliliter, they'll be getting two milligrams of CBD, which is not a bad initial dose of CBD. And it wouldn't also be a bad dose if it was a THC product as well. And of course, we tell them to titrate the dose by another 0.1 every three days and monitor for any changes in pain. Uh, they, and of course, if they um, begin to see a benefit, right, we tell them to stop um, titrating the dose. And we normally get the question asked to us a lot as to when they um, expect to see a benefit or when they expect to see whether um, you know, a medication is working or the cannabis is working or not working. Now, there's not a lot of substantiation between you know, um, what dose they would expect to use because it, again, it's very highly individualized, but we do tell them that at a dose of around 20 to 20 milligrams of CBD, especially for products that are CBD dominant, they should see some sort of benefit. If they're using products, let's say uh, they've used multiple CBD products, they've titrated up all the way to the, to the point where they're using two milliliters or 40 milligrams of CBD, and they've used two different products without effect, um, what do we do? In this case, again, it ties into that notion we discussed earlier. Um, about the fact that there are many active compounds that are not accounted for in products. So it would be worthwhile to tell them to try a different CBD product rather than just 
quitting after using one CBD product. So if they've tried um, one CBD product, they've tried it, tried to it up to 40 milligrams, they're still not attaining any benefit, it would be worthwhile to try a different product because of the fact that there may be the presence of other active metabolites that may be, that can potentially the, um, the effect of CBD in that new product that they're using. So what if the patient fails several CBD products? In this case, this is when you would want to have a one-to-one -one discussion with the patient. And of course, if they're clinically indicated and they don't have any contraindications to THC, that's when you would sort of use or add in a product that would have a little extra THC. So in this case, this is kind of like a one-to-one -one product. So 10 milligrams per mil of THC and 12 to 15 milligrams of, uh, per mil of CBD. So if they were to start at 0.1 mil, they'll be getting about one milligram of THC and about one and a half milligram of CBD. Um, and again, you inform them uh, the greater the THC dose, the more risk of side effects. We normally see this a lot where patients can actually use multiple C multiple cannabis products throughout the day. Uh, and that can be worthwhile. So for instance, this regimen over here uses a cannabis product or a CBD dominant product um, in the daytime, three times a day. And they're using a THC dominant or a one-to-one -one product uh, at around bedtime or close um, to bedtime, just because it may help them sleep appropriate. So that is okay, of course. We recommend this product not for cannabis naive users, but for those who are experienced with the use of cannabis, they already know the effect that um, cannabis has on their on their body, but we do tell them to sort of um, tabulate or account for the total amount of THC that they're getting from all their, their products, such that um, they're not uh, at risk of experiencing or getting a super therapeutic uh, effect. Okay, so let's discuss some case examples here. So let's meet Thomas. So he's a 56-year-old male veteran. He has a significant history of chronic low back pain with radiculopathy, uh, an SLAN score of 19 indicating neuropathic pain involvement. He's tried multiple first-line neuropathic pain agents such as pregabalin, duloxetine, um, but of course with little effect. They're currently on gabapentin, 1,200 milligrams three times a day, oxyneo, 20 milligrams twice daily, and Percocet, one tablet four times a day when required. The interesting thing is that they use up to two milliliters of a CBD dominant product. So it contains 20 milligrams of CBD and five milligrams of THC per mil only for flare ups. Okay, so that two mil, they would be consuming or getting about 40 milligrams of CBD and up to 10 milligrams of THC. So upon further discussion, uh, what we find is that he actually does report a benefit through the use in um, of that product in managing his flare-ups. However, it causes drowsiness and he refrains from using it daily as a result. So what's the drug therapy problem here? Is that he's likely responsive to CBD, but does not tolerate high doses of THC of 10 milligrams or so. And that is, that is fair. That is considered a strong dose, especially for someone who's not used to consuming um, THC on a daily basis. So what would be our recommendation in this case? You would try a different CBD product that has about less than one milligram per mil of THC, and it'll still be, they would still attain um, about the same dose of CBD they're attaining, so about 40 milligrams of CBD. And then we ask them also to start low and titrate up slowly. Even if they've already used a product of CBD, and they know that it was beneficial, again, because we don't know about all the other active compounds or active um, cannabinoids that are not accounted for, we still ask them if they're using a new product to start at a low dose and we go up slowly. That way he can benefit from the daily use of CBD to target his persistent pain without the adverse effects of THC. So at the time of discharge, what do we find? So he was consistently using a CBD oil product containing about uh, 25 milligram to 0.7 milligrams per mil of CBD to THC. And he titrated the dose up to 1.5 mils at bedtime. So he would be getting about 37 and a half milligrams of CBD and about one milligram of THC. And that provided him with moderate reduction in pain, including less numbness, spasms, and burning sensations in his back. Ultimately, what that did actually is that not only did it help 
provide um, adequate pain relief, but it was able to he was able to reduce his first set use to about twice daily when required. So we see an overall reduction in their opioid use or their opioid burden. Second patient, um, James, is a 44-year-old male who suffered a motor vehicle uh, accident and presented with significant history of low back pain or radicular features into his left lower extremity. What's important to him was that he had strong evidence of neuropathic features, such as burning, tingling, numbness, and electric shock-like sensation. Also important was he had a past history of opioid use disorder where he was abusing hydromorph content and oxycoset, but fortunate for him, he successfully weaned off his opioids. Uh, he had not tried any first-line neuropathic agents and was not interested in starting any of them. He said his pain was managed primarily with multiprofen cream, uh, but what he was using was four times a day CBD oil uh, in a very high CBD concentration. 100 milligrams per two milligrams, so four milligrams daily in addition to smoke dried leaf extract, which he was hard, it was difficult to quantify how much CBD and THC he was getting. So what was the strategy we used with him? So on further discussion, we came to realize that his total daily dose of CBD to THC was 1600 milligrams CBD and 32 milligrams of THC. In addition, it was difficult to quantify with the smoke dried products. What he did state was with the CBD, he was able to taper off his opioids and keeping his pain levels manageable. But now with this particular regimen, he was getting six hours of continuous sleep and attributed that primarily due to his ca uh, cannabis um, uh, use. Despite multiple attempts to try to get him to change his routine, he was not interested in trying anything else. So we suggested that he maintain his CBD dose, advised him to vaporize his dried leaf product as opposed to smoking it to reduce the risk of lung complications. Health Canada, if you go onto the website and they talk about cannabis, they um, indicate that the dose remains highly individualized. And I think I've been prescribing cannabis now, as I said, since 2008. And over the 15 years, I've seen a whole variety of doses that uh, patients are using. So I would agree that you have to individualize not only the dose, but the combination of the two. So at the time of discharge, James was notified that his cannabis use was high, but no signs of hazard, hazardous use or cannabis use disorder would ident identified. In his particular case, the benefits outweighed his risk. It helped him taper off his opioids. He was functioning well. He was sleeping well, and it gave him appropriate uh, pain relief. He was, however, amenable to vaporizing rather than smoking his dried cannabis. Ideally, we would have had him reduce his CBD dose, but unfortunately, he was not interested in that uh, change. Okay, so for the third and last patient case, um, we will meet Rose. So she's a 51-year-old female veteran, um, past significant history of chronic neck pain, secondary to cervical stenosis, and also uh, chronic mechanical low back pain and uh, a wide range of um, uh, mood disorders, so PTSD and, and depression as well. Her pain detect score of 17 indicated possible neuropathic involvement. Uh, her pain averaged at about 5 out of 10 and reports sleeping difficulties. Uh, she's trialed past medications in the form of naproxen, brigablin, trazodone, all discontinued due to lack of effect. So her current medications consist of nabilone, 0.5 milligrams at bedtime, Contrave, um, Ciprolex, as well as a CBD edible of 10 milligrams that she consumes once a week when required. So how can we optimize cannabis use? So upon further discussion about her cannabis use, she is attaining about partial benefit with her current dose of Navalone. She still complained of difficulties with sleep latency and maintenance. So how can we optimize 
per synthetic cannabinoid use. Our recommendation, we can increase the dose to about one milligram at bedtime and also reassess. Of course, we've provided counseling in terms of adverse effects that she may experience at a higher dose of nabalone, such as drowsiness, dizziness and the next morning, dry mouth, increased appetite, cognitive effects, because at the end of the day, um, nabalone is a THC mimetic. And it is also off-label for both pain and sleep, but has slight, slight or limited evidence in terms of um, in terms of benefit. So the ultimately the decision was guided by the fact that improvement in sleep can contribute to better chronic pain management and overall better outcome in that case. So at the time of discharge, she reported more drowsiness uh, for the first couple of days. That uh, basically waned or she was able to alleviate that by taking nighttime doses earlier. She reported improvement in sleep onset with less frequent awakenings. And she reported that her average pain was the same pre-admission, so still at around 5 out of 10, but reported less frequency of flare-ups throughout the week. So this was a case where um, an optimization using synthetic cannabinoids in order to um, manage sleep or improve sleep can contribute to better overall um, pain management. So thanks for listening. This concludes our presentation and we'll be happy to uh, take on questions at the moment. Thank you very much for your presentation. So once again, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box and then I will read them out. One question, the first question, uh, how did James afford that cannabinoid regimen? Did his insurance company for the MVA agree to cover it for him? Mamu, do you recall how he paid for it? I, I believe yes. So um, he did have, I believe he did have access to um, an insurance company. So he did have access to a third party um, insurance company that was providing him or giving him financial benefits. About 70% of the patients I treat are veterans, and Veterans Affairs Canada will cover their uh, cannabis for them. Next question from Joseph from Ottawa. Uh, any conclusive evidence on similarities slash differences in absorption between oral across the intestine and oral mucosal and sublingual absorption across oral mucosal administration? So... Absolutely. There is difference between um, sublingual routes um, and oral routes. Of course, the when you're applying or when you're um, ingesting cannabis sublingually, you're actually able to bypass more of the first pass metabolism. So the bioavailability is actually higher compared to um, oral routes where you're just um, swallowing the uh, the capsules or or the uh, or the oils. So a sublingual routes definitely or generally will have a higher bioavailability compared to um, oral routes. I think the one thing patients often complain about in sublingual is the taste. Um, and that's why they prefer the uh, capsules or uh, oil or putting it into uh, any other of their foods. Next question. What are the GI health implications of orally consumed cannabis, oils, edibles, et cetera? Um, yes, yeah, so certain, again, so for instance, certain capsules or soft gels, they can contain excipients that can cause upset stomach or they can cause nausea. We have seen that before. Even if we are to, um, if we recommend products that don't, that are not soft gels, so they're just purely cannabis oil, there is that, um, you know, the, the GI adverse effects, the the common nausea or adverse effects that, you know, that can be related. But we do tell them that um, these side effects or these symptoms do subside uh, the longer you're using the, the product. And if we find that the side effects don't subside at all, it would be worthwhile to recommend a different product, um, maybe from a, um, a more reputable supplier. And if that's the case, then, of course, we would definitely recommend a different route of administration if they're still experiencing um, GI adverse effects from oral routes. 
Next question, are more insurance companies covering cannabinoid therapy? So uh, that that it's it's very dependent on the type of uh, insurance company. Not all of them do. Um, certain third parties do. For instance, as Doctors at Rise has indicated, um, Veterans Affairs um, they they have a uh, program where they can cover medical cannabis for their patients. Um, of course, WSIB. Um, but in terms of other pharmaceutical or other insurance companies, it's it's very dependent and it differs. So. Um, that would depend on what plan or what type of plan uh, the patient may have. Next question. Why rely so heavily on CBD for the treatment of neuropathic pain when all evidence points at THC as the main driver of pain relief and QOL improvements? Yeah, th that's actually a... Um, that's a very good question. So most of the studies or a lot of the newer studies that have found benefit um, for the use of medical marijuana or medical cannabis for neuropathic pain actually used um, medical marijuana that contained um, CBD dominant products. And they also contained one in one products as well. Um, there, of course, are products that are THC dominant also. And it would be interesting to sort of do some further analysis or further studies to sort of elucidate exactly you know, if it was the, you know, the THC dominant product or the CBD dominant product that actually had a, a better effect. Um, but from the studies that I've seen in terms of um, managing neuropathic pain with the use of medical marijuana, uh, they've used uh, mainly products or they've used products that had CBD. And also the fact that most of the side effects are dominated from the use of THC in that case. So that's why they would recommend products that are highly CBD dominant if they've used multiple products um, of CBD products that don't work, then that's when you sort of incorporate THC into the regimen. Next question, what accounts for James's and patients like him ability to tolerate the high doses of CBD? Is it inter-individual variability in metabolism prior to OUD and medical history, or is it high variability in actual CBD content in the meds, i.e. the actual concentration varies from the product label? Yeah, that's also a very, very good question. So we we uh, we need to consider the fact that there is, high, yeah, there's definitely high intervariability between, um, you know, different cannabis users. There's um, patients that are able to tolerate very high amounts of cannabis, either CBD or THC, others do not. Um, and we know that because, of course, cannabis are, or the, the excretion or the metabolism um, of medical cannabis is involved or involves the use of various um, CYP enzymes. Some patients do not have appropriate concentrations of these CYP enzymes, so they're not able to tolerate higher doses um, of cannabis. But specifically for, in that case, for, for Thomas, I believe he, he definitely um, started, he did a pro, when we talked to him, he, he used a very uh, start low and then go up slowly approach. But also the fact that when he found that it was helping him wean off of his opioids, um, that is basically was the, the driving factor for him to continue the use and um, basically uh, tolerate these very high doses or continue the use at these very high doses. I think if he was amenable to alternative uh, treatments, we probably would have lowered his dose and used other um, first and second line agents for his neuropathic pain, but uh, he was hell bent on not taking anything else. So uh, that was the biggest challenge with him. Um, and um, I think a lot of patients see cannabis as a natural product and um, pharmaceutical companies as unnatural products. So he would rather have a single very high dose of CBD as opposed to combining it with some other medications that I believe would have given him equal, if not better relief. Next question. You mentioned that one patient was taking Nabilone. How do you determine whether, a recommend, whether to recommend prescription drug like Nabilone or cannabis through medical access program for patients? Very, very good question also. So actually, if you were to take a, a look at many of the guidelines um, or evidence behind the use of um, cannabis for 
you know, for, for chronic pain, they actually do suggest to start with synthetic cannabinoids or the pharmaceutical cannabinoids, such as Navalone in this case, simply because of the fact that um, the products have appropriate quality control and you know exactly what you're getting. Um, and of course, if they fail synthetic cannabinoids, then you can actually consider um, medical marijuana in the form of, you know, phytocannabinoids. I think in her particular case, she travels to the U.S. Um, in the winter. And so it makes it a little easier uh, without having to switch products. Every time she goes south, there's a snowbird. Um, so for her, Nabalone worked, and it's, uh, it's easy for her to travel with it. From Samantha Rundle. Uh, can you speak a bit about tolerance? For instance, do you find that you need to increase doses in order to keep pain levels the same? If so, how often do you find that you need to increase doses? And by how much do you usually find a patient needs to increase to achieve the same effect? Again, that's also a very good question. Uh, yes. So it is definitely foreseeable that a patient can tolerate a certain dose of um, of cannabis. So let's say if they try titrate it all the way up to two milliliters, which contains 40 milligrams of CBD, and they've been using that for quite some time, and they find that it's not giving them appropriate pain relief um, as before. We normally ask them in that case, if that happens, um, the frequency, first of all, it depends from one patient to another. Some patients, it, you know, it can take longer for them to experience tolerance, other patients, not so much. So it's really um, patient specific, but when that happens, one method that we can do is that we can basically apply like a, a slow wean or a slow taper off, right? Um, or a break from that, from their cannabis use, and then reinitiate it at, um, at a later time or at a later date. I think that also speaks to Raymond Yang's question. Can you elaborate the relationship between CBD titration and CBD tolerance? Too slow with titration may be at a higher risk of developing tolerance. Um, between CBD titration and uh, CBD tolerance. Yeah, so the yeah. relationship between CBD titration, so just slowly increasing the dose every three days or so, and um, CBD tolerance basically is yeah when when yeah so if you if you find a dose that um that you're able to tolerate basically what what i mean by that if you're titrating up to a dose of um 0.6 milligrams say so that's about let's say it's 30 milligrams of cbd and you find that when you move up to 0.7 or 0.8 milliliters you're experiencing um more uh fatigue more dizziness more drowsiness um, you're likely yeah not or, or the, the dose may have been too much of a jump so what you can do is that you can reduce or go back to 0.6 mill milligram or 0.6 milliliters and, and then titrate um, a lot more slowly. So try 0 0.6, 0 0.61, 0 0.62, 0 0.65. Um, I hope that answers that question. I think that's... Two more questions. Uh, first, many physicians completely scoff at cannabis as an option. They will not even refer patients to cannabis clinics or experts such as yourselves, leaving the person to fend for themselves. Uh, do you think more education should be done in medical schools about cannabis as medicine? Um, I'll take that one, Mahmoud. Um, when cannabis was legalized, um, myself and the other pharmacists, I'm I'm blessed to have, as you've probably seen, an outstanding pharmacist like Mahmoud with me and his partner Vikas, and I did the education for the OMA, where we tried to educate physicians in this province on how cannabis works and how to prescribe it. I think there is a level of paranoia around cannabis um, that, frankly, is not warranted. Um, it would be good to be able to educate all providers, nurse practitioners as well, of screening the patient to know who would be a good candidate. What is their diagnosis? Which product will work for them? How do you monitor them? Because in the right hands, with the right monitoring, this will work. The challenge has been the monitoring has not been great, where with some of the online prescribers, they would prescribe uh, cannabis 
And I've had patients say to me, they have not been followed for one year. Um, and they uh, try to figure it out themselves, going online, talking to their friends through social media. But I think it would be good that whoever's prescribing it follows up with the patients, whether it's on a weekly basis, um, for the first two to three months. We did a study probably four years ago with people who started on cannabis, and it took roughly eight to 12 weeks to get a uh, stable dose. And for those eight to 12 weeks, they need to be monitored closer. And if you do that, you will find out who will benefit and frankly, who's not going to benefit from it, that you could stop it. Final question. Uh, what drug-drug interactions do you specifically look for in prescribing medical cannabis? Yeah, very good question. So, for instance, uh, THC can be metabolized by CYP3E4. So you want to look at um, medications that are common inhibitors of CYP3E4. So those would include your antifungal, certain antiarrhythmic medications, certain antibiotics, right? So um, those are you know, things that you would want to look out for uh, before prescribing something like um, medical cannabis. Also, a lot of pharmacists, they have pharmacy management software that would basically trigger uh, whether there is um, a clinically significant interaction or so that you can definitely implement that to see whether um, whether a medication is metabolized through CP3 or 4 and whether that's going to interact with cannabis. All right, I think we'll stop there. There is one more question in the Q&A box. I don't know if Mahmoud or, or Ramesh, if you could take a look and, and type the answer to that. And I'll turn it back over to James. Thank you so much, Ramesh and Mahmoud, for an excellent talk today. I, uh, I found it really illuminating. This has been a, a very stimulating day. Um, and I look forward to tomorrow when we kick off our in-person uh, sessions. Um, any final closing words, Chase? No, I no, we're good. With that. I, I think the uh, uh, feedback from the participants online has been excellent. Very good questions, uh, which has really enriched the presentation. So I would encourage people to continue to be interactive, continue to come with your questions and areas that you want clarification on. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's very valuable, not only for you, but also for the rest of us that can uh, hear the answers to some of these questions. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ramud and Ramesh, again. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.